people are still considering you the worst day of your life, every day of your life. It's something that no one prepares you for. All the hardship and pain were not for nothing. My voice matters. Good evening, I'm Judy Maggio. Tonight on Decibel, re-entry and second chances. We're here at Austin City Hall where the City Council passed the first fair chance hiring ordinance in the South. It prevents private employers from asking about criminal history when someone applies for a job. It is very challenging for those who've served time to find work. So we want to begin tonight with the story of an Austin woman who discovered her sentence did not end when she was released. Decibel's Blair Waltman Alexson has Sandy's story. I'm very open about it. I'll tell you up front, I've been in prison. It's a, it affects you. But you can't have an apartment because you have a record. You can't have a job because you can't have a record. You can't have food stamps for some reasons because you have a record. So everything revolves around you having a record. Hello? This is, this is Sandy. Hi, how are you? KOT is Keep On Talking, and it's for women inmates that have gotten out. So we do it teleconference. It's just a way for us not to feel like we're out there all alone. My check-in is I'm feeling inspired and moving forward. I went to Plain State, which is a state jail, and I went in January of 2016. Well, I wrote some hot checks back in 2000, and I couldn't finish paying my probation off, and so I had a warrant issued for my arrest for hot checks. It's not like I'm gonna go apply right now and they're gonna have a job for you because it's not that way. And I had a lot of people tell me, no, we can't hire you, you're a felon. Texas Department of Criminal Justice says it offers reentry programs at 108 facilities, including all of its state jails. Those programs and other reforms have led to a drop in the recidivism rate in Texas. Reincarceration for state prisons is at a low 21 percent. But advocates say the reentry programs are limited in state jails. Even though inmates serve less time in jail, they still face all the complications of a conviction when they try to reenter the workforce. That's one reason why the reincarceration rate is higher for state jails, at over 30%. Oftentimes, people are being released directly from a state jail facility. They're released probably having not um, had much in the way of vocational training. They probably haven't received any evidence-based treatment. There's no post-release supervision. They aren't required to have a housing plan, and the state wouldn't have housing for them even if there were a requirement. So oftentimes people are released directly from a state jail facility into homelessness or into the exact same circumstances from which they came, not having addressed the real factors that led them into the criminal justice system to begin with. The pressure on that individual to survive is extremely high, and they're probably going to find ways of surviving that they knew prior to prison. When I was in Plain State, I asked one girl in particular who had been there 22 times, and I asked her, why did you do this? And she said, because I'm a prostitute. I prostitute for drugs. So it's easy for me to go back out there and do what I do because I don't have anybody or no place to go. Most of them don't even get off the bus. They don't even get off the bus before somebody's approaching them because they, they know they're coming home and it's not good, you know. There's not enough safe places for, for women to go and that's a big barrier, you know. Like I went home to my family and that wasn't the smartest place for me to go, but that's all I had at the time. And I went to CDS and applied with the man there, told him, I said, I have, I have a record. And he says, well, they're going to do a background check. He said, but you're hired. And so I got a part-time job. He took a chance on me and hired me, and I still have that job today. There's not very many people that do that second chance. 
but there have been some improvements made to the whole reentry system. The Texas prison system is getting better at making sure that people leave with identification. They're doing workplace skills. They uh, make sure that people have access to vocational training, make sure that people have GEDs. Oftentimes, these improvements are only impacting a small subset of the entire uh, group of people who are leaving uh, state jail, prison, or even county jail every year. So we have a long way to go. Welcome to Women Unshackled, the next step. Yeah. Oh. She was at Brian. Ah, mm -hmm. how long mm -hmm. have you been out? Um, almost two years. It, it continues to haunt you. And I think it probably will haunt me, speaking for me, the rest of my life. In some avenue, it's gonna haunt me, you know, so. Uh, I'm just the type of person who de has decided to move forward and do what I want to do to help people like me. Um, now I'm trying to take a humanitarian's class. I became an ordained minister on the 1st of June. I, I want to start going back into the prisons. Yeah, now I definitely want to be a motivational speaker and advocator and do whatever it takes to help people who can't do for themselves. I wish that they would understand that Everybody deserves a second chance. Sometimes we just need a yes. How long do you have a person pay for a mistake? Mm -hmm. Latrice Cook runs a local nonprofit helping former prisoners find new purpose. She says giving people a second chance can benefit the entire community. I just feel like as a, as a member of society, we need to understand that anything can happen to anybody at any time. And so the judgment of not allowing people to live and how does that, be how does that benefit our environment or our society by not giving a person an opportunity to live. It's a long road from prison to politics, but local organizer Lewis Conway found his calling here at City Hall, where he was on the front lines in the fight for a fair chance hiring. Now he's making history as the first formerly incarcerated person to run for Austin City Council. Decibel's Joe Rocha looks at how Conway's re-entry experience led him down this path to politics. Re-entry Finding a job is different. Finding housing is different. Relationships are different. Fathering is different, right? And those concepts aren't taught. Those concepts are not even um, uh, introduced at all at, at any point. And those are the most uh, crucial components that will determine the quality of your freedom and the length of your freedom. So if you don't address those, uh, then it won't be long before you go back to prison. Energy that hooked into me like a talent and dragged me around until I could break free. We moved to Austin uh, when I was about five years old from Abilene, Texas. Right? I didn't come from an impoverished. Uh, neighborhood. I came from a two-parent family. The circumstances that led to my incarceration uh, centered uh, specifically on choices. I was introduced to, you know, uh, drugs and, and, and gangs in college. Lewis started selling drugs to pay for tuition and to fit in with his group of friends. College became that place where I was introduced to that male bonding. And so it was the first time where I felt a different kind of affection that I never felt at home. At some point, I felt like um, it was whack for my dad to be paying my tuition. But the next turn of events changed his life forever. Uh, I got robbed. When I got robbed, he took some stuff that was not mine. I couldn't afford not to have it back. And uh, I went to go get the money back, and he wasn't having it. Lewis says a gun was drawn on him, and in self-defense, he stabbed the man. That man later died. Lewis called the police himself. It was me calling the cops saying that I, I killed him in self-defense. 
And when the cops came, I gave my statement to a, a detective on, on the scene. And I ended up giving a second statement downtown. And it's the co contradiction between those two statements that my attorney leveraged in convincing me to take a plea bargain of 20 years. When you're doing time, you actually think you are being punished. You actually feel like your sentence is your punishment. So when you come home, you are expecting that you have served your time. And so when you enter this system and this society to where people are still considering you the worst day of your life, every day of your life, it's something that you, no one prepares you for. So reentry for me was hard. As many folks facing reentry do, Lewis struggled to find employment. To meet parole requirements, Lewis found work as a DJ at a strip club and freelanced as a music video director. That lifestyle led to a major health scare and sent him to the hospital. I was drinking monster energy drinks and five-hour energy drinks and taking every energy supplement I could, and I, and I ended up in the hospital with an irregular heartbeat, a high blood pressure, um, and a, a pulse that was at like 145. But that's where he woke up to his true calling. I made a, um, a plea bargain. I prayed to God, and I said, God, if you let me live, I'll tell my story. That put me back in the prisons, being able to walk out. It put me in places that hiding my background never put me. The moment that I came public about going to prison and the impact that that had had on my life, doors began to open up. And at that same time, there was a fair chance hiring conversation going around nationally. Some folks from Greg Kassar staff put together a contingent of former incarcerated folks, put us in the room, right, and asked us if we were interested in trying to push an ordinance. From that is when grassroots approached me about being an organizer. age before beauty. <laughs> Fair Chance Hiring is an ordinance that was passed in Austin in March of 2016. It seeks to, you know, give folks with criminal histories a fair chance at being judged. And that is how I taught Matt Lewis. I had an opportunity to uh, hire an organizer and I, I knew I wanted to hire Lewis. He's a star. He can talk to anyone. He is not afraid of his history. I think, you know, having fought for policy change as an advocate, as an organizer, as someone who's uh, directly affected by the policies that you're changing, I think recognizing uh, the power of folks in office, um, particularly in, in Austin, uh, and be that voice from, from the dais. Lewis filed to run for City Council District 1 in a crowded field of candidates. So our campaign is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to electoral politics. We are the first time in history where someone with a criminal background has placed their name on the ballot. When we talked about being here on this day, we definitely didn't think, <laughs> right? But most importantly, it, 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 it's, it's 100 million people across America that have a background and their loved ones and their family members that are now able to see themselves where they were once the problem, now becoming closest to the solutions. Absolutely. So for me, it's the ending of a cycle. It's turning the name Conway from prison to politics. As Lewis Conway said, people will judge you on the worst day of your life years after you've left prison. But how do you take that critical first step? Austin's Integral Care partners with the Travis County Sheriff's Office to connect people with the resources they need when they're released. While finding a job and housing are essential, it's also crucial to find mental health support.
If you can imagine, when you leave jail, you're told, don't hang around the same people you've always hung around with. Don't do the same things you've always done. You need to change your thinking. Basically, you need to change your whole lifestyle. And so you're taking away the support system, which may not be the best support system for that person, and, and we've got to give them a new support system that'll help them make the transition. They might have lost their jobs while in jail. Many of the women in jail might have custody issues when they leave jail. All of these things create these confluence of risk factors for suicide. Art is another way to meet mental health care needs both during and after prison. The Freehand Arts Project is providing a creative outlet for prisoners and giving people in the outside world a glimpse of life behind bars and beyond. Inmates have stories to tell. And Offering a writing class or offering a visual arts class gives them a way to express themselves. And inmates, whether it's in jail or outside of jail, they often do not feel like they are in control of their own lives. So when you say, tell me the story about your arrest, tell me the story about your childhood, tell me about your favorite vacation spot you went to, you give them an experience to narrate their own life. Giving inmates art is the seed that can, we don't even know what it can grow into. Tonight we are having the anthology release party and the anthology consists of original poetry, creative writing and visual artwork from the students at Travis County Correctional Complex and in addition to that we're having an art show as well as hearing from some of our teachers and students um, associated with Freehand Arts Project. The Freehand Arts Project is a group of volunteers um, and we bring the creative arts to people incarcerated in Texas jails and prisons. Our teachers work at the Travis County Jail and um, they go in once a week and they teach classes that are between an hour, an hour and a half long. They teach creative writing and visual arts. And then we find ways to publish our students' work and display their visual work in galleries. Oh, I didn't see that. Some inmates also come because they're bored in the units. You're lucky if you can order a book from the library and get it within a few weeks. So these inmates usually have nothing to do nothing to do. And we're like, hey, take a poetry class. And some of these, these women or these men are like, oh, I've never done poetry in my life, but I'm bored, I'm gonna try it. And they show up and they're like, wow, I'm in a place where I'm wanted. I feel like I have control over my life. I have this 60 minute experience of freedom, you know, and it can really change them, even if it's in small ways. It takes a very unique person to work really hard to get into a place that everyone else is trying to get out of. And I literally had never wrote poems or even thought about writing any type of anything. And I think I was in one of the first classes. Um, actually, when you're there in jail, and it's not the best place. So you try to do everything you can to kind of escape the dorm, the women, the wearing the stripes all the time. You just want to escape that for a little bit. So one of the girls that was in the in my dorm, she was like, hey, come with me, it's a poem class. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so, because I'm not a, a poem person or an English person or a writer. Um, but I went and I was like, you know what, hey, I like this. And it's things that you might not be able to talk to other people about, but you can jot down. I'll tell you, the person we have here tonight has a very happy ending. I'm gonna ask you to please give your warmest welcome to Vivian Trevino. So you don't really see people who have been incarcerated given the opportunity to share their stories. I'll ask them to return to the poetry or the, cre the um, longer memoir pieces that we've read and I'll say, pick your favorite phrase or line. And two days ago, the most common phrase, five different women out of a group of 25 women picked the same phrase and it was, someone has tried to kill me. And it blew me away. Family and friends have come and gone. Some some to return and others never more. You know, I feel like that our experiences with inmates can help heal emotional wounds, can give them an experience of control and self-confidence that they, they can take with them to other parts of their lives. I hope that people take away not only the beauty and the vulnerability of a lot of these pieces, but take away the realization that there are thousands of people
who are behind bars, this isolated group um, that deserves our attention as much as anyone else. When I took the art class, it's become part of me now. I journal more now. I've started doing painting classes. It's something that has followed me, and you learn a little bit about yourself, no matter who you are. Art really can play an important role in that self-discovery. Women are the fastest growing segment of the prison population. And for nearly two decades, one local nonprofit has helped those women find their voice. All of my incarceration has been around drug use, um, substance abuse. And so um, my last incarceration was eight years ago. And the one in the middle was kind of the big power punch because I had gotten arrested a couple of days after I found out I was pregnant with my first son. Lauren Johnson's story is a common one in prison where happy endings are hard to come by. But sharing that story is proving a powerful tool in changing lives. How she sees the world, how she sees herself, how she responds to other people, um, and then also the, jo the choices that she's been making along the, the way that she is accountable for, that now in hindsight she looks back and she can see yes. that these things are what led me to where I am today. Katie Ford runs the nonprofit Truth Be Told. We provide safe community and healing programs to women during and after incarceration. What we seek to do is restore integrity to incarcerated women and thereby break the cycle of incarceration. Truth Be Told is a rarity in a reform system built by men for men. But with women, the fastest growing segment of the nation's prison population, it's needed now more than ever. I was seeing women who had histories of physical and sexual abuse essentially entering a correctional system that was built with punishment in mind and the messaging that the women receive while they're incarcerated echo the messages that they were receiving from their abusers their whole life. These women entering a punitive criminal justice system to expect them to be better neighbors, better mothers, better citizens on the other side is severely flawed logic. Carol Wade has volunteered with Truth Be Told for 18 years. She not only works with women inside the prison, she's their lifeline once they leave. Carol is the reassuring voice when women check in once a week. I'm very passionate about a woman finding her self-worth and finding that she can forgive herself and that she can find a place where she could share some stories that she never wanted anyone to know. Lauren Johnson's journey is now far from secret. She's told her story dozens of times as a performer in Conspire, a theater group where formerly incarcerated women share their experience through creative writing and performance. Now Lauren works for the ACLU as an advocate for criminal justice reform. In other words, her story is far from over. The highlights are like knowing that my voice matters, knowing that I didn't go through all the things that I went through, all the hardship and pain and all of those things were not for nothing, right? Like I get to use those things to help other women to change policy, to change perception, um, and that makes all of it worth it. Finally, we turn to teenagers. When they're incarcerated, it often sets the tone for the rest of their lives. But there are some inspiring ways the Central Texas community is helping them get back on track. Crescent Ogren was in and out of juvenile detention, doing drugs and hanging with the wrong crowd. I realized that I wasn't doing anything with my life and I really didn't just want to throw my life away. I was really unhappy and miserable. and. I just wanted to change my life. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Crescent then discovered the New Start program with American Youth Works in Austin. Learning the construction trades and working with his hands gave him new direction. Now Crescent's working full time as an apprentice electrician, and his goal is to eventually become a master. We want to end on music with a message. Musician and motivational speaker Saul Paul served two years in the state penitentiary, but quickly got his life back on track and graduated from UT with honors. Now he travels the country performing and sharing his inspiring story. His song, Rise, is a big hit. Oh.
moment, rise to the occasion. Open your eyes, recognize that it's greatness. Within your reach, if she sees it, here she take it. Can you see it? Can you taste it? Destiny. Hard work and the plan that has a recipe. But success that the launch you with them blessings be. The road to riches, though, that's what I'm testing be. But I'm focused and you're not stressing me. No, that you're not stressing me. So, I'm saying, rise, rise. And open your eyes. Now is our time for you to shine. Yeah. Rise, rise. And open your eyes. Now is our time. Providing a second chance is not a partisan issue. Reentry and criminal justice reform are areas where Democrats and Republicans find that rare common ground because we all benefit when barriers to opportunity are lifted. If you enjoyed tonight's Decibel Special, be sure to like our Facebook page where we premiere our stories. Thanks so much for giving us your time tonight. Good night.